morning and welcome to this Euractive online event, which is kindly supported by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the Energy and Environment Editor of Euractive, and I will have the pleasure of moderating today's event titled How to Decarbonize Heavy Industry from Quick Wins to Long-Term Solutions. The decarbonization of heavy industry uh, has become somewhat of a hot topic uh, in Brussels these days, and the reason is quite simple. As Europe moves forward with more ambitious climate policies, all sectors of the economy will have uh, to contribute to reaching the EU's goal, which is to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And that means also heavy industries uh, such as steel, cement and chemicals, which are considered hard to abate. So what solutions can be put forward for these industries and what policy incentives can be put in place in the short term but also in the long term to reach the EU's decarbonisation objectives? These are the topics that we're going to discuss today with our panellists, uh, starting with Mette Cufford Quinn, Head of Unit at the European Commission's DG Klima, Sirpa Pitikainen, a Finnish MEP who is a member of the European Parliament's Economic Affairs Committee, Bax Orman, Senior Lecturer at Lund University in Sweden, Erika Mink, Head of Government Affairs at ThyssenKrupp Steel, and Alexander Fleischhandel from Prime Metals Technologies. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. We'll start this virtual conference with a short series of opening statements from the speakers, and then we'll move on to a moderated discussion and Q&A that will also include uh, questions from the audience. To ask a question, just click on the Ask button on Vimeo and put your question in writing. I'll try and reserve some time towards the end of the conference uh, to take a few of those. I think that's all for me for the introduction. So, Mrs. Mette Cofford Quinn, the floor is yours now for a brief introduction from the European Commission side. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes, good morning and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, indeed, uh, decarbonizing um, heavy industry is a very important part uh, and keeping it heavy industry in, uh, in Europe is a very important part of the decarbonization efforts uh, in Europe. Um, in order to support this process, uh, we have the European Green Deal uh, put in place, which is uh, a policy that uh, should support uh, the transformation of all uh, economic sectors in Europe towards uh, climate neutrality. Um, important uh, support is to have clear policies, long-term policies in place. Uh, so by setting in the European uh, climate uh, plan uh, a decarbonization um, objective for 2050 in place and to have a clear climate target for 2030 of reducing emissions by 55%, I think we send a very strong signals to all actors uh, in industry, investors, um, and uh, and everyone that uh, that this is the way we need to go. And I think that's the strongest uh, support uh, we can give. Um, but besides that, uh, we have a number of detailed policies that will also support uh, industries in the decarbonization. We see is the most important policy is uh, is putting a price on carbon. Uh, so the EU emission trading system does that uh, and uh, energy intensive industries uh, are of course a, a part of it. And the EU ETS has uh, delivered so far in 2019, we have re emission reductions of uh, around uh, 9%, which is a very good result. We haven't seen the 2020 data yet. Um, but the, the main part is coming from the power sector, whereas industry is, is uh, is had a reduction of 2%, which is good, uh, but we need more than that. Uh, so we are revising our policies now to, to strengthen that, and not only uh, the EU emission trading system, but also other supporting uh, policies. Uh, we need a comprehensive tool set, uh, so it's also energy policies, 
and it is uh, fuel policies. Um, it's a number of different things that together uh, will support uh, the de decarbonization, including also funding mechanisms. So um, we see it as a, as a, a broad set of, of measures that need to be put in place in order to support uh, industry to uh, decarbonize. Thank you, Medic Offit Quinn. Let me turn now to the other hand, other side of the legislative making uh, institutions. Um, so turning to Sirpa Pitikainen from the European Parliament. Sirpa, we cannot hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, uh, it was my bad. I muted myself and forgot to unmute. Well, someone needs to do it in all of the meetings, so this was my time to, to, to make the mistake. So, uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this extremely important uh, discussion. Plus, then, a big thank you for heavy industries of engaging so heavily on this decarbonization, a green deal, and resource efficiency. And even though the challenges would look great, I think that the European possibilities on the quality of the work, uh, the technology and innovation uh, give us a huge advantage and possibilities. Then the question is that how do we make this cooperation uh, on place and how do we gear our politics to bet the best uh, support this transition? And a couple of points from the policy power perspective and uh, parliament uh, perspective. First of all, uh, I think, and I would advise you all as uh, industries to make transition plans, be it year 2030 or 2040, depending on the exact uh, <clears throat> industry or site, but there needs to be the target when this is going to be uh, happening and what are the concrete steps in the transition plan that are going to be taken. Secondly, in link with this, uh, I think that having the external auditing system so that uh, uh, it is verified that the steps are really taken is important. It is environmental wise, but uh, it is investment wise too. And let's see then when we go a bit further, uh, with the uh, uh, taxonomy, the sustainable finance, and its delegated acts, not only in climate, but also in the resource efficiency, what kind of uh, opportunities there might lie for this sector uh, based uh, on this transition and new green, uh, clean avenues. Then, of course, uh, and maybe we discuss it uh, uh, later, it is the debate and discussion how we can use the uh, uh, border uh, adjustment mechanism, uh, the CBAM, uh, to, to compensate or to facilitate the costs and the structural challenges that we are facing. Then there's the question, a bit delicate one, I know, but what can we do in our pub, uh, state aid and public procurement and also this vast uh, uh, RRF funding to support these kind of a structural changes, what uh, we are seeing and uh, what, uh, what we indeed need. Then uh, we briefly heard already <clears throat> the different elements of the Green Deal. We have the sustainable finance. We have a, a pretty extensive uh, <coughs> circular economy roadmap and the product uh, package is coming on this uh, uh, avenue in the future. This is something what we need to look closer and to see how these actions can be supportive to each other and can be that kind of a guideline for heavy industries to gear the next investment and changes. While we are going to have a discussion, and sorry about my voice, it is about the allergy because happily we are having a spring here in Finland uh, coming. Um, so last but not least, it is the joint public-private uh, partnerships and what we can do in the hydrogen economy so that it is 
based on clean renewable energies and what kind of avenues it can be uh, 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 it can, uh, what kind of avenues it can uh, give uh, for heavy industries but then again and uh, there i will conclude the big question where uh, probably and hopefully we could have a separate discussion is how to safeguard the resources uh, in Europe and how to create the circularity in this field also. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Pepitikainen. And uh, as the rapporteur on the taxonomy regulation, uh, I'm sure we uh, will uh, briefly touch upon that topic later on in the discussion as well. Uh, let me turn now to Max Orman from uh, Lund University. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's a nice meeting. Uh, I have several comments. I have some comments on technology and probably some on policy as well. But I would begin by talking about time. Uh, as Mette said, the direction of change is quite clear now in policy 2050 and zero emissions. 2050 may seem as a very long time, but in an industrial perspective, a very long investment cycle, it is actually not that long time. Uh, <clears throat> the things we will do the coming five to 10 years will determine the ability to actually change things after 2030 as well. So I think the time issue is important. And I think that zero emissions by 2050 should be really treated as a boundary condition. Uh, there will be no offsets. There will be nothing else to rely on, each industry has to make its own plan how to actually reach really zero emissions. Uh, I think this is crucial. The time issue also have some other implications when it comes to what we can do in the short term, apart from doing research and creating the conditions through infrastructure for making a long term transitions. Uh, there are also some investments that need to be really carefully considered before making them. For example, is it, vi is it feasible to make a reinvestment in a major unmitigated blast furnace, expecting it to be able to run like that for 20 years? Well, probably not. Probably have to sort of consider that in 10 years, the demands for reducing also process emissions will be much, much higher. So the uh, long-term target and what it implies in the coming five to 10 years needs to be considered in all investments as well. And especially when it comes to any kind of investment that relates to pu putting money into what is already today fossil infrastructure. <clears throat> uh, this has implications, for example, I would just take one example here and that is CCU in the steel industry. Uh, I'm kind of skeptical to this, uh, not, not per definition, but at least as a large scale option. It will take time to develop this and the carbon capture part is really crucial for us to develop the capacity. But uh, I'm kind of questioning whether will the chemical industry be interested in using fossil carbon in the future in 2000, after 2030. They will also most likely have the demand to go for green carbon or completely recycled carbon for waste incineration or anything else. Uh, so at least at a scale, this will be a kind of a risky business as well. What can we do in short term? Of course, efficiency is always good. We have known that for long. Uh, <clears throat> so that's really no problem. Uh, but circularity is always good. Here, steel industry is a really good candidate because they already had a large circularity. Uh, scrap has a high value. So the process ongoing now that we're reducing the number of blast furnaces and replacing them more and more with electric arc furnaces it's a natural process in business happening as more scrap becomes available. Uh, the next heavy industry that needs to make this kind of more circular transition uh, is actually uh, the plastics industry or the petrochemical industry. We still reuse or recycle far too little plastics or petrochemicals than we actually could do. But then again, this has so far no value and here we need kind of both policies and also research and development to uh, enable plastic recirculation, circularity. 
I have also two points on policy. One is border carbon adjustment, which is we now is most likely to see. And I think most people agree this will not be a silver bullet, but it will ease the pressure on a European industry to some extent. But it might also as well cause trade problems that we want to avoid. Uh, <clears throat> I would just like us to focus on what is actually the ultimate price that we want with this. We want to be able to decarbonize European industry and keep it in Europe, but we also want the rest of the world to follow us and to decarbonize their industry as well. Uh, so we need, I would suggest we need to sort of combine any kind of border carbon adjustment with some kind of ambitious cooperation programs as well, both for market cooperation and also for innovation cooperation, because uh, decarbonizing industry just in Europe will not help. I mean, there are several things going on all across the world. So I see there's plenty of opportunities to actually increase this. One example that has been floated around is some kind of green club or green materials club or green steel club. These are things worth, worth of consideration. And we need to also, in this context, keep in mind that we're operating under uh, the UNFCC and fairness is a major issue here. So we cannot just avoid that question. We need to look at fairness issues as well when we uh, introduce a border carbon adjustment. Uh, on the EU ETS reform, uh, as Mette said, it has created a lot of directionality, especially the last five years, and industry has responded to this by adopting plans. Uh, I see some technical details here, and now I'm a little bit showing off that I'm not really 100% up to date on the EU ETS reform right now. But at least before, I saw that there was a risk of how do we treat allocation regulations for free allocation when we have, for example, uh, incumbent blast furnaces that might add CCS as a retrofit option compared to greenfield uh, hydrogen direct reduction facilities, for example. So we don't create a mismatch and some uh, missed opportunities or misallocation of resources here. Okay, thank you. That was my comments. Thank you, <clears throat> Max Allman. Uh, let me turn now to Eric Mink from ThyssenKrupp Steel. Yes, thank you, Frederick. I'd like to just give a bit of more um, a flavor from, from, from our perspective and from uh, our daily life. I mean, you mentioned so many aspects which we are undergoing here right now. So I think we all agree that, um, you know, the Green Deal can only be delivered if we get the steel industry decarbonized. And also to Krupp Steel, we are on our way, on our race to net zero. We have a climate neutrality commitment by 2050. And this is a massive, a massive undertaking. We are one of the leading uh, global suppliers when it comes to high grade steels for the automotive industry, for wind turbines, e-mobility, packaging, etc. Also a lot of areas where you cannot use uh, recycled materials. So we our market is, is, is very much also in, in primary steel production. But decarbonizing the steel industry, it's a huge lever, as we already heard. And just to, to give a few numbers, we today at Tucson Group Steel, at this plant in Duisburg, which is our main plant, we emit two million, uh, 20 million tons of CO2 every year, which is about 2.5% of Germany's total emissions. So that's the bad news, but the good news is we have, a, we have a technology, we have a technological solution to decarbonize, and we have a plan to step-by-step step replace the blast furnaces by green hydrogen-based direct reduction facilities. But this, of course, is um, very costly. Um, with this technology, we are very optimistic. We have just, uh, again, externally reviewed it uh, and, uh, and the external reviewers validated the technology and, uh, and uh, conclude that it is really highly innovative also because our past does not require greenfield operation. So it can be applied while operating, um, during operation and production at all major uh, integrated steel mills around the world. We can reach 
20, uh, uh, 30 percent reduction by 2030. So we have a roadmap in place. As Sirpa mentioned, you know, we agree this is absolutely important to have a plan mapped out step by step. And we plan to produce about 3 million tons of green steel already by 2030. But right now we are at a very critical juncture. The long investment cycles have already been mentioned and we need, in fact, to take investment decisions already this year in order to get there. And there, as you'll know, are quite a few uncertainties. Um, first of all, we, under current conditions, we do not have a business case. So we need the regulatory framework really to bridge the transition from the carbon economy to the hydrogen economy. And for to do this, we have a relatively short window of opportunity. So when it comes to uh, critical success factors in terms of policy, a lot has been mentioned, but I'd like to highlight, first of all, it's a fair competition. And that also links to establishing an effective carbon border adjustment mechanism in addition to existing carbon leakage protection. You may know that especially the steel industry is exposed to uh, carbon leakage. We are the most heavily traded material in the world and we compete with producers in countries that have far less um, um, obligations and, uh, and uh, no, no price or low prices on, on carbon emissions. And even under a CBA mechanism, you know, they would only need to, uh, to apply a, a carbon border adjustment or a CO2 levy for what they import into the EU, which is a small fraction of their production. So to get this really just and fair is quite a challenge, especially under the uh, framework of, of WTO. So longer term, maybe we need to think of a mechanism of a more international mechanism um, and an international carbon price for steel among the leading uh, industrialized nations. Second, the existing carbon leakage protection needs to be maintained and strengthened. And this is a very heavily debated subject, but in the current transition phase, the allocation of free CO2 alliances must remain at current levels, at least until 2030. And we probably have to think about new instruments and additional incentives and uh, to, to get the infrastructure and the breakthrough technologies in place. And thirdly, financial support. It is absolutely critical for us to have predictability also in terms of financial support for this decade at least. So existing programs like the Innovation Fund or IPCI for hydrogen are absolutely critical projects. And here I think it's really important that we can agree that we should prioritize those factors and applications where we get the biggest bang for the buck. And we look at it from, an in, from a conversion rate. How much CO2 abatement can I get for one ton of green hydrogen? And steel has the highest uh, exchange rate. One ton of green hydrogen uh, can abate 26 tons of CO2 compared to mobility, where we talk about six to seven tons uh, CO2 abated and other industry sectors, the conversion rate is lower. So we would argue, let's start where we have, where we get the biggest impact for the money spent. And of course, we have, uh, there are discussions uh, of additional tools. We have increased or we will have increased operating costs when we use green hydrogen. And there are mechanisms discussed uh, to, to compensate for those, partly at least. And here we also have, uh, we would need to see uh, or get quite some mileage uh, in terms of setting these up and uh, adjusting uh, state aid rules uh, accordingly. So, but to conclude, I really think, you know, we all have the same objective. We know where we need to go. The devil is in the detail. And I think it is a joint responsibility we are having between policymakers and industry to get this right. And it's also a, a joint responsibility to get this transition just because so many livelihoods and families depend on, our, uh, on us to really secure the transition and at the same time, jobs and employment for the future. Thank you.
Thanks, Erika Mink. Uh, let me turn now to um, our last speaker for the introduction, and that is Alexander Fleischhandel. Frederick, many, many uh, everyone being delighted having been invited invited to this uh, to this panel. And um, even I'm uh, not uh, representing the European uh, steel steel industry, but uh, we are. Uh, active in the international uh, plant building and therefore developing um, uh, technologies for decarbonization. Uh, I'm going to um, to continue uh, basically on the statements that Erica uh, made recently. Um, so we as a plant builder see indeed more, more opportunities uh, than, than, than roadblocks uh, with, uh, with the decarbonization. But, when it comes to uh, steel making, uh, well, um, what is at stake is not not profit uh, uh, today. It's uh, more survival that we see. And just to put a couple of more figures uh, into the uh, into the discussion, to transform um, the actual uh, fossil-based uh, steel industry uh, into a hydrogen-based um, industry uh, with um, direct reduction. And the EF requires about one billion of, of capex per one million ton. Uh, so, just assuming in in, in Europe we we actually producing around one hundred sixty million ton, you can imagine uh, what it takes uh, to to transform that uh, that industry. Uh, second uh, point um, is on the operational uh, cost, as uh, also mentioned by, by Erika. Also, there is a high burden. And uh, just last week, I, I read in Handelsblatt uh, that uh, Boston uh, Consulting Group uh, put the cost of uh, around 300 euro per ton of steel as a premium price if it uh, comes to, to green steel. Another statement uh, made by Mr. Köhler from uh, Dillinger, uh, also uh, just recently, was actually there is no market established for a premium price for, 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 for green steel. So these are all issues we, we have to discuss, we have to def define at the end to, to have this um, um, certainty in, 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 the, in the planning, in the planning uh, process. So far, I would say, well, um, a couple of uh, major steel producers have announced their clear strategy. Reading the recent Agora uh, report, six out of 29 uh, steel companies in, um, in, in Europe have a clear pathway announced that uh, meets the um, less than two degree uh, increase um, in climate uh, temperature by 20, 2050. Um, so, uh, Thyssen Group, ArcelorMittal uh, are uh, amongst them. Anyhow, what we can see today is uh, just, um, I would say, call it crumbs on the table. Uh, if we look on the size of electrolyzers that are um, in operation today, we talk about 10 megawatt, uh, 20 megawatt. So, we will um, have to see um, uh, a huge uh, multiplicator in 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 in, in the scale of uh, of of, of uh, technologies. Anyhow, I would uh, conclude with uh, my my announcement announcement. Uh, we from uh, the as a technology provider see that the technology itself won't be the uh, the the roadblock. Uh, it's it's more up to uh, the the cost. It's more about the huge uh, requirement for renewable energy and electrolyzer uh, capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander Fleischhandel. Um, we can start now the, uh, the debate. Um, and uh, so I'll try and divide this conversation in two parts. First, uh, we'll try and focus more on the short to medium term solutions that are available uh, to decarbonize heavy industry and the steel sector in particular. And then in the second part of the debate, we'll focus more on long-term solutions, uh, and that is uh, mainly hydrogen. Although, um, as Eric Ming said, uh, preparations need to be uh, made now, of course, uh, for the hydrogen economy uh, to be fully up and running as of the 2030s. 
So uh, let's focus first on short to medium term solutions. And let me uh, maybe stay with you for a bit, Alexander Fleisch Handel. Um, so uh, you did mention um, uh, the options that are available um, uh, currently for the steel sector uh, to decarbonizing the, uh, the solutions. Uh, there are some solutions which are already available now. Um, so what kind of policy incentives do you think um, are needed in order to encourage uh, the steel industry uh, to invest in, in those uh, solutions, uh, given, given also uh, the, the competitive environment that the industry is faced with? Uh, we know, for example, that uh, Chinese uh, overcapacity in steel is actually equal to the entire production that we have uh, in Europe. So the, the, the scale of the challenge uh, is, is probably enormous. Alexander Fleischhandel. Yeah, yeah, Frederick. Uh, uh, through what what you uh, what you're saying here, uh, I would say first first of all, um, looking in, into the European steel industry, uh, there are uh, large achievements. Yeah, if we just look uh, how much uh, the the steel industry has decarbonized uh, so far uh, over the past three decades, um, it's um, 43 percent. Uh, so that's uh, that's great. Uh, still, the second half of the marathon is uh, um, most likely uh, more, more more difficult to to take. Uh, still, there on the short term, there there are multiple measures that can be uh, implemented into the existing uh, steelmaking uh, routes. Um, so starting with uh, or continuing with the energy efficiency measures, but uh, the the most important one is uh, when it comes to new the development of new new steel grades. Um, there is really this uh, race is 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 accelerating when it comes to um, low weight and um, um, advanced high strength uh, steel grades. And at the end, that's uh, an important topic. Uh, we cannot continue um, with uh, producing more and more 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 steel uh, and the only measure uh, to to avoid that is uh, to use the steel more effectively uh, in 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 the in the automotive in the infrastructure everywhere second um, point uh, i would like to mention is uh, coupling processes uh, still this is in a, in an early stage for for example uh, endless uh, strip uh, processing so avoiding simply uh, to um, cool down the, the slabs and, and reheat it uh, again then for, for the rolling, but uh, doing direct uh, direct rolling. And it improves the yield and uh, subst substantially increases the, the energy efficiency of, um, of um, the, the, the steel product. So as long as it comes to, to this integrative uh, measures in, in material efficiency and energy efficiency, I would say it doesn't take so much uh, support from uh, the politics um, uh, everything that is in place uh, now uh, looks uh, looks pretty 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 okay but uh, if it comes to larger investments um, um, then replacing um, blast furnace uh, replacing other facilities uh, like conversion steel making by electric arc furnace steel making and we are talking about uh, really huge uh, capex requirements um, that's the uh, that's the gap where where we have to find the, the proper mechanism um, to to support the the European steel industry um, um, sufficiently. Uh, um, okay, I would, uh, I would, I would, let, maybe let me follow up on on that. But what do you see uh, therefore as a potential? incentives uh, that would uh, encourage uh, steel producers to make those investments. We heard uh, Eric Mink, for example, saying that um, any carbon border adjustment mechanism needs to be uh, implemented, but only in addition to existing measures, such as free allocation of, um, of, of pollution credits under the emissions trading scheme. Do you believe this is um, also something that is absolutely necessary to keep uh, until 2030 in order to allow the, the industry to make those investments? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's a combination of uh, uh, all these measures, uh, starting from uh, ETS, uh, and, and we saw um, an um, elevated price level uh, now in the new new phase for, for the ETS. So uh, we exceeded even the threshold of 40 euros per ton of, uh, of CO2, uh, which uh, supports uh, definitely investments into decarbonization. The other thing will be, and uh, I think it will be required um, to put the uh, carbon uh, board adjustment mechanism in, in place, simply for uh, a fair competition, still is and will always remain a, a globally traded uh, uh, product. And um, um, I mean, last but not least, uh, we, we have to, to find a, a proper mechanism how to, to compensate for uh, the uh, higher cost uh, when it comes to uh, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, I avoid green hydrogen, but low, low carbon hydrogen. So still, um, if we compare it with, uh, with gray hydrogen today, um, well, um, Grey hydrogen is, uh, let's say, around 1.5 euro per, per kilogram, while green, green or clean hydrogen is around uh, 4 euro uh, per kilogram of, of, of hydrogen. So we have to find a way how to, how to compensate, compensate this um, uh, higher cost in, 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 in the clean hydrogen. And then uh, I'll, I'll end it there with you. What, what do you think could be put in place to compensate for this? There's been suggestions such as uh, carbon contracts of, uh, of difference. Is that something that you would support, uh, Alexander Fleischhandel? Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would indeed support that. Uh, the other thing is really to establish uh, a, 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 a premium price for, for green steel. Uh, as said, first of all, I think uh, it requires a definition of green steel. That's uh, also something um, which is not so clear so, so far. Every, everyone is uh, talking about green steel. But uh, at the end, uh, we, we have to launch uh, the same discussion that we have on, on green and clean uh, hydrogen uh, to define what, what is uh, green steel. And uh, otherwise, you cannot establish a, a market segment uh, for a premium price on, on green steel. But having then uh, this uh, multiple mechanisms uh, in, in, in place, um, that will allow to, to go also for larger uh, investments. And uh, as said, um, also by, by Max uh, initially, I, I'm, I mean, if uh, investment decision is done, that's uh, done for the next three, four decades in, in this industry. So it's really uh, an extremely important decision uh, and it has to be uh, validated and there, there, there have to be planning um, security in, in, indeed before, uh, before you go into such investment. Thank you, Alexander Fleischhandel. Uh, let me turn now uh, back to the policymakers and the Sirpa Pitikainen. Um, I saw uh, uh, that you were, you were nodding or shaking your head uh, rather when Alexander Fleischhandel was uh, mentioning uh, the issue of uh, uh, maintaining the free allocations uh, under the ETS. Uh, so I understand this is not uh, a policy that, that you would recommend. Indeed, sorry to say, no, I would not. Uh, and I do fully understand and share the worry that we need to have the supporting mechanism for this transition, as I said in the first comment. But then uh, I just leave the questions for you. This premium uh, price for green steel, the definition of it, what kind of a investment support we would be talking about and how we can streamline it in the state support system. And uh, then the question um, uh, about uh, how this operational long-term cost can be sort of a taken into account. These are things that I, I hope that we continue the discussion. And uh, then this sort of a double structure with uh, uh, carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism and free allocations. I might be totally uh, wrong, but according to at least more than 10 experts, uh, both from WTO side, uh, on the lawyers from trade side, WTO side and environmental side, 
have uh, pretty clearly uh, stated and convinced me that this kind of a double compensation system uh, is not uh, WTO compatible and it does, just does not work. And then the question is, and I know it's a bit of a Sophie's choice for you, which one is more important, the free allocations or then the uh, CBAM mechanism? I would assume that the CBAM uh, would work and this might be the direction where we should be then going. And then instead of uh, trying to have um, uh, this kind of a double structure, I would like to see and seek some other avenues. What Erika said already about this kind of kind of a transition period, I don't know, be it five years or uh, ten years uh, seems to be a pretty long time, even in WTO uh, scale. Uh, that might be doable for a certain period of time. But then again, as a long-term uh, solution, um, I'm afraid uh, that we would be just fighting the windmills. And uh, um, maybe just to stay with you uh, on that topic, uh, Sirpa Pitikainen, how would you see that transition happening from the current system of reallocation to one which uh, is entirely uh, dependent then on the, on the new uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism? How do you see the transition happening? Well, uh, of course, we need to see that it takes a certain time span to have first the CBAM on place. And then we would need to uh, negotiate uh, and so have a, let's say, global understanding and with our partners, what is the transition period? Um, be it five years, well, I just pick it out of my head, so this is not the fixed number, where we would indeed have the double structure and then gradually or a bit earlier on already gradually one would phase out the free allocations and then it would be left with the CBAM mechanism and it functioning. And already during that period, we would need to figure out the investment support mechanism for this uh, hydrogen uh, uh, economy and uh, maybe to, to think some uh, uh, ways and tools what we need in this uh, operational costs. That, uh, and then again, I've read the same figures the question is that are they going to be added operational costs uh, uh, forever or is it just the introduction period of a new technologies uh, also? And uh, uh, then, uh, then, then this might be something, something what, uh, what could be worked uh, out. And then uh, because we know how urgent uh, the climate crisis is, and how short time span it is for 2050, not to talk about 2030. I would be very, very cautious about uh, uh, investing on a fossil phase uh, based uh, a hydrogen economy, or it should be really, really short term. And then the question is, would it be better to scale up gradually uh, from step A where we are now up to the renewable energy uh, capacity, hydrogen, and uh, knowing very well that the costs then are higher, uh, even though the prices of renewable energy is going down, the question is um, um, uh, what, uh, what, what can we uh, do there to, to, to support it? Then, of course, the question is what, what do we mean when we talk about carbon neutral hydrogen of course, I'm not in person as a person favor for uh, nuclear, but of course we have the existing nuclear power plants and that indeed is carbon neutral. So that would be one option, but sort of a using fossil based uh, energy uh, in transition and then using just the compensation mechanism. I'm, I'm really doubtful and skeptical about that. Then maybe later on we could discuss about the CCU uh, Avenue. Max was very skeptical. I'm slightly skeptical about that also, but certainly that would be something to to touch uh, maybe later on also. Yes, uh, indeed. We'll we'll discuss a bit more in detail about hydrogen later. Uh, but let me stay uh, for the time being with 
uh, with the uh, with the industry and turning to you, uh, Eric Mink, um, th this um, you know idea that uh, maintaining free allocation and a carbon border adjustment mechanism at the same time risks um, not being compatible with uh, WTO rules. Um, is that something you've um, accepted um, uh, as part of industry, or do you believe there's still a way to make the two work together? Well, you know, I, I think we indeed see the challenges here, you know, from, from a legal perspective. And I think, Serpa, you, uh, you described it uh, a very, uh, yeah, that we, we, we get the same, uh, you know, the same understanding of the legal situation. But there is, of course, at the same time, a business reality to that. And our reality is that, you know, we have now to take, um, well, we actually have to decide by the end of this year, put, do we put one, mil, one billion at the table um, for, uh, for the first um, direct reduction uh, plans to, as an investment? And we also know that, you know, if you think in uh, the time it takes to get such, a, such a, an installation set up, um, so the and by the time it's really fully operational and we can achieve the CO2 reduction as planned, you know, in the meantime, already the CO2 costs will increase according to the current system. While we still do not have a significant CO2 reduction because it's, you know, there is a time, a time lapse in, in, in the process and in, in, the, in the roadmap. Um, and at the same time, you know, we, we would then lose a big part of the free allocation. It would simply add additional operating cost, which uh, would be hard uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to pass on uh, up, upstream uh, to, to customers. So what we are looking at, you know, or what we see is if we lose free allocations on one side, we need to see what could be a mechanism to compensate elsewhere. I think it's, you know, it, it's left pocket, right pocket. In the end of the day, we would need the, um, we cannot afford such a dramatic increase of operating costs in addition to what we already get through the, through the transformation process. So, and I think this is really something we have not thought through yet together between industry and policymakers uh, deeply enough um, to see, you know, to find perhaps alternative solutions. But I think we need, we all agree where we want to go. We all um, need, agree that we need to respect, you know, WTO and, and, and international uh, treaties and agreements. But at the same time, we need to find a solution whereby we keep the steel industry, yeah, that, that we can, you know, that we can grow and uh, in Europe and continue our business here and, and be part of the green transformation and delivering the Green Deal. So, um, so, so that's, that's for us, you know, the dilemma we are in. And I, I strongly believe, you know, we have to, we have to put uh, more efforts in understanding, you know, these mechanisms and, and, and look for a solution. Thank you, uh, Eric Ming. So let me turn now uh, back to the, uh, to the policymakers and uh, uh, Mette Coffert Gwyn. Um, uh, the European Commission is, is currently uh, drafting its proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And we've just heard the, the, the investment needs on the side of industry are, are, are huge. Um, but indeed, if free allocations under ETS and the CBAM cannot uh, live together uh, side by side, there needs to be a phase-in, phase-out. How, how can uh, the European Commission then create uh, the conditions for the investments uh, to, to take place. Uh, yes, thank you. Indeed, um, we are preparing uh, for June uh, this year the, a proposal on uh, introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism for a few sectors uh, to start with uh, of the energy intensive industries uh, and then uh, to keep free allocation for, for the, 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 re the remaining of the sectors. Uh, and there are a number of different policy options that are being studied now, so uh, it, it will come out in, in June. Um, I mean, one of the problems that uh, carbon, um, the risk of carbon leakage is, is, um, is well uh, addressed so far with free allocation, and, and I, I can agree with, with that. However, what, what it doesn't do is that it, it blunts a little bit the price signal for the ETS to ensure that we have the investments. 
and and now we need to focus very much on putting in place mechanisms so we ensure we have uh, investments um, and by taking away free allocation you will have a, a clearer uh, price signal uh, from from the ETS um, but that's not uh, going to, to to do it alone and as I also said in, in the introduction so we need to have other measures in place um, and we are looking at uh, energy and climate policies uh, very much together because one thing that we need is to uh, uh, scale up uh, renewable energy. Uh, an enormous amount of electricity will be needed, uh, both uh, to the electrolysis processes, but uh, to producing all the hydrogen that's needed. Um, so support, and there are various supporting mechanisms under the, the new recovery funds, uh, but also under the innovation fund and invest in EU and so forth. We need to have public support to, uh, to roll out uh, very fast the renewable energy so we can bring down electricity prices uh, that's going to help uh, the investments and um, in in the new green technologies uh, in the energy intensive industries so i see we have a lot to do on the electricity to uh, to to uh, get interconnection in europe to get a better internal electricity market uh, for renewable energy uh, but besides that, I think we also need to, to look at the policy framework to support the business case uh, for um, uh, green industrial invas investments. Um, so we need to look more at how we can support uh, climate neutral and uh, circular solutions uh, and also how to, uh, to exploit digitalization better. Uh, there's a big potential also for reducing emissions from better digitalization uh, in, uh, in industries, but not only in industries. Um, and we're looking at a specific uh, new product policy framework. We have been doing the taxonomy and I'd like to come back to that. I very much support the EU taxonomy that will uh, support uh, to show where uh, investments are really going towards zero um, uh, to, to decarbonization, but also a product policy framework uh, we are looking at right now to ensure environmental and sustainability criteria for raw material for products and services. And we are coming with a proposal for that towards uh, the end of, of this year. And this will also help uh, consumers and investors in, in uh, supporting the right choices. Um, and then I said, indeed, we, we, we do need to give public support also to industry in this transition. Um, it's going to cost uh, an awful lot. And I think uh, uh, the steel sector has said around 50 billion needs to be invested. And I think we have a lot of public support mechanisms in place. Uh, and we have been used to doing a lot of grant funding and also, uh, uh, and also some financial instruments. But there might need, be a need to look at new instruments such as the carbon contract for difference that could be a good complement uh, um, to ensure that we, we do make the investments in the breakthrough technologies uh, that are not profitable. Um, we are looking into to that, uh, whether that could be an option. But of course, it's very, very expensive uh, because with such an instrument, you do support the operational cost for a number of years. And it doesn't fit with the normal uh, rules that we have uh, for funding. Uh, but it is a way that we're exploring on whether that is an area we could go into at European level. You see already a number of schemes at national level supporting this. But there might also be a case at supporting at European level uh, to ensure that, uh, that there's a more harmonized approach across member states. OK, thank you. And uh, Mete Gofford Green, just uh, to be to be clear, uh, do you uh, share Sirpa Pitikainen's view that uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, cannot live alongside uh, the free allocation system that we currently have? Um, do you agree that the two are not WTO compatible? Yes, indeed. This has been uh, clearly stated by the Commission. We do not see that the two instruments uh, are compatible at the same time. It uh, it will it will be a, a double funding, and it will not be WTO compatible. Um, so we are, are looking at a number of different uh, uh, ways of introducing the carbon border, border adjustment mechanism, and uh, 
indeed there might also be a need for a transition phase um, and and we are looking at how that could be uh, that could be done okay thank you uh, let me turn now to Max Orman to uh, maybe wrap up this first part about the short-term uh, measures up to 2030. Uh, we're seeing now the, the kind of challenge um, in which uh, the, the, the industry uh, and the policymakers are, are being faced with. There's a fierce competi uh, competitive environment uh, with China uh, producing uh, tons of steel at very low price. Uh, and at the same time, a, uh, an urge to decarbonize uh, very quickly uh, in the European Union um, and, and produce uh, green steel uh, as quickly as possible. What do you think, uh, Max Orman, would be the best way forward, the right policy mix to encourage uh, those investments? Well, I mean, uh Ambitious decarbonization targets on a global market uh, for Europe, of course, trade will be uh, will come into a conflict with this target. <clears throat> and uh, I think that is sort of so I, I think the carbon border adjustment is is re reasonable. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, free allocation has served us well uh, so far. But my main problem is that it supports basically in fossil infrastructure and dilutes the price signal given by the EU ETS. Uh, so it has served us well, but it's no longer sort of effective in my view. Uh, now the short term thing, I think, uh, and I think Alexander touched upon this and some other also, is actually to create, to help by policy to create markets for green steel. But then, of course, we need a definition or we need several definitions. What do we mean with green steel? What do we want to support with, for example, public procurement? We can use it there. We can use it in carbon contracts for difference. And there is also just certification issues because I know anecdotal evidence still, but there seems to be at least a quite a reasonable market uh, for a private sort of market for buying green steel actually and paying a premium that is not based on policy so i think that uh, clarifying the market uh, signals and you know creating this market or helping this market a green steel premium market to materialize would be a quite good way out of the situation uh, <clears throat> i think that would be then of course we do have uh, the green uh, green hydrogen issue as well mainly based on uh, what's the cost of electricity and the cost of electricity is determined uh, by the production cost but also by a large portion of the taxes and levies issued upon it and there we have already quite low prices for uh, uh, industrial electrification at least for the very very electricity intensive part of the industry but uh, again it's not a competitive advantage because we have it basically across the whole world we have very low electricity prices for the very very electricity intensive industry okay thank you uh max orman and so uh let me turn now uh to the more long-term uh perspectives uh, then for um, decarbonization uh for the steel industry and that's mostly looking at uh hydrogen like you said uh max orman um, there were suggestions uh, from, from Eric Mink um, to, to make um, uh, green hydrogen available in priority for, uh, for the steel makers and, and probably also for other sectors of industry which don't really have other options than hydrogen to decarbonize uh, because uh, electrification is not something they can do uh, immediately uh, at least. Um, uh, let me turn to you, uh, maybe Serpa Pitikainen, uh, for uh, a reaction on that. Do you uh, agree with uh, Eric Mink that uh, green hydrogen, which is currently not available in, in sufficient quantity, uh, should be made available to those sectors like steel, like chemicals, like cement, which, which need it the most? And I think you need to unmute yourself, Serpa. 
yes, I think um, uh, that uh, it should be made available. And Mette already referred uh, on these different instruments. And I understand the, the need from the steel industry side that you need to make the investment decisions now to get them on uh, ongoing uh, in, uh, in due time. But then again, uh, what it means on the other side is that we would need to look together what are the possibilities to use this uh, RRF uh, mechanism, just transition fund, to use uh, e e EIB, Invest EU, and some other elements on this investment decision. And when it needs a bit of a research or co-creation, this uh, joint public uh, private partnerships, when uh, the research element is uh, included. And maybe there's something else uh, that is uh, needed. But then again, as I said already, already early on, I would go directly uh, to to the full full green and renewable as in in as large scale as possible, and then to see if EU invests on on this adequately, if that sort of would help uh, compensate uh, compensate uh, to compensate the prices uh, also. But then the question is not to make this kind of a sort of a uh, halfway solutions. And this is my fear with the uh, hydrogen. Um, uh, as, you, uh, as you probably know, there's a lot of discussions to turn the fossils, uh, fossils to hydrogen. And then really, I don't think that we are making any, any adequate progress. So it needs to be at ambition level right. And then the support uh, to start with right and then the green steel, and that goes to taxonomy also. And so it is a, uh, it's a package, it's a set of actions we would need to decide uh, together instead of, instead of a debating yes or no with the WTO comp compatibility or uh, whether these actions are needed or not. Uh, and I enjoy this very much, this uh, good spirit of working together what we are having uh, right now, where there's the will, we'll find the way to. That's uh, at least a, a, a positive note. Uh, maybe let me turn to Medic Offered uh, Quinn now um, for um, uh, a reaction uh, on this. So uh, it seems there's some kind of consensus, I sense at least, between the industry um, and even some of the green uh, movement and, and some, some lawmakers like uh, Sirpa Pitikainen uh, to say that uh, green hydrogen should be used in priority for sectors uh, like steel, cement or chemicals which don't have uh, many other options to decarbonize. Is that something uh, that the European Commission has uh, sort of um, incorporated into its thinking as well? Um, I think we're maybe not quite there yet. Uh, I think we need we see it as, as a need to to really focus on uh, the hydrogen production, clean hydrogen, uh, and we have uh, launched a number of initiatives to support that. Uh, we have uh, the hydrogen strategy and the, the hydrogen uh, alliance, and supported also by the industrial strategy uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, and in the alliance, uh, encouraging uh, everyone to cooperate, so industry, um, member states, civil society, uh, and to, to move forward uh, to, to produce the, uh, the hydrogen uh, that's needed. There. And there's a need for hydrogen in, in, in a number of different sectors. Um, so I think that's where our focus is primarily now. Uh, that, uh, and I indeed, I agree uh, with Siapa that uh, it's, it's very important to work together, and we do work together, I think, closely public and, and private sector in trying to, uh, to, to get this investment and, and get this, uh, this uh, really started and so we can move to, to bigger scale um, uh, within some years. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge, um, uh, but whether we are there yet, I don't think we are, we are there yet to say specific sectors uh, should have priority. And uh, uh, let me follow up on this then. What do you think uh, would it take 
uh, for the European Commission uh, to say that you have reached uh, that stage. I understand that the Commission prefers probably to keep a very neutral approach to uh, how hydrogen is being used, that you're probably leaving the, the market to design this. Uh, but how long do you see this maturing? You know, what kind of time frame are you seeing um, before the European Commission can potentially make a recommendation that hydrogen should be used in priority in certain sectors more than in others? Oh, that would be very hard to answer right here uh, when we would be able to say that. Uh, and that would also be to confirm uh, your, uh, your, um, yeah, your, uh, your assumptions. And, and I don't think we are there. Uh, we are generally technology neutral and we would like to support the framework for bringing the technologies forward. Uh, and there are a number of different technologies and a number of different pathways. Uh, and I think we need to leave that to the private sector mainly to, to, to move forward. Uh, they know best uh, on that. Uh, I am not, uh, I, we are not there to, to say it must go this way and that way. And I don't think we have very often good uh, results for that. But what we can do, as I said, first is to bring the actors together uh, and let them uh, bring out uh, priorities uh, for which technologies uh, to go for and, and, and find the ways for investment. I think that's very important. So bring the, bring the, the frameworks in place and the, and the players, uh, but um, actually to, to, to have a technology preference, uh, I don't think would be the right thing to do from, uh, uh, from the public sector side. Um, but I would say these, uh, these um, alliances uh, are already uh, showing good results. We have a batteries alliance that has been uh, in place for a little bit longer. And that's already showing good results and cooperation within Europe. And, and I think that's, that's the way to go uh, to support that the actors uh, are working together amongst themselves. OK, thank you. Uh, let me turn maybe to Max Ormond now. Uh, do, do you share uh, the view expressed by Mette Crawford uh, that it's too early to uh, decide or put uh, incentives in a way that would direct uh, hydrogen production in certain sectors of the economy like steel making? Uh, do you agree uh, that a more neutral approach uh, needs to be adopted and, and that the market should be able to decide or do you believe um, a more command and control, or at least, or at least nudges um, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the steel sector, among others, uh, can uh, be at the receiving end uh, of hydrogen as a matter of priority? Well, uh, first of all, I think that the steel sector is where, <clears throat> and the chemical sector will be a priority regardless of uh, what policy do actually because the large investments required uh, to produce hydrogen would also require to secure some kind of large-scale demand and that will only come from big industri industrial sectors like steel and chemicals <clears throat> so i think it's wise for policy not to go into detail and try to direct but let the market decide what the policy perhaps could do is to make sure there are no other incentives to other sector that kind of makes it much more profitable to sell hydrogen due to some kind of some policies for example the transport sector where we have a lot of other options or the heating sector where we also have a lot of other options so it's more for policy to make sure that the market actually is well functioning and I do believe then that industry will have the biggest need and thus also will actually become the priority for steel uh, for hydrogen producers. Okay thanks uh, Mark Solman. Um, let me turn uh, now to uh, a question coming from the audience uh, and which is addressed uh, to uh, the two representatives of industry so Eric Mink and uh, Alexander Fleisch handel um, Is hydrogen and electrification the only renewable solutions uh, that you're considering for decarbonization, or do you have also other options uh, that you're thinking of? Uh, and maybe uh, you can start, Eric Mink. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Now, our main decarbonization route will be uh, will be hydrogen. Uh, that's uh, that's where we have the biggest uh, the, the, the biggest possibility uh, to get uh, to climate neutrality by 2050. Right, and, and, and the role that you see potentially being played by technologies such as carbon capture and storage, do you think that will be uh, significant or marginal? Well, we also have in our group a solution, uh, we call it carbon to chem. So it is an area where we look at because we know that we may not be able to get, uh, to get all everything to the last bit uh, decarbonized uh, with hydrogen. So we have, of course, this as sort of flanking uh, options, but our primary route um, as an integrated steel mill is hydrogen solutions. And for the rest, we see, you know, can we, can we use them here and there as complementary uh, mechanisms? But as I said, primary solution is hydrogen. Otherwise, we will okay. not be able to get to climate neutrality. Okay, that's clear. Alexander Fleischhandel, um, uh, maybe a few thoughts on, on your side about the relative role of hydrogen and, and CCS. Do you share Eric Mink's view that hydrogen is the way to go long term? Yeah, thank you. Basically, I share, I share this view. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are uh, multiple measures, but uh, if you want to go for carbon neutrality, the, the only pathway is to follow hydrogen and electrification, So, uh, which goes along then with electric arc furnace with uh, high power requirement on, 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 on renewables. So uh, what I just want to uh, add uh, here uh, maybe is uh, it's, it's the pace. And uh, the pace at the end is driven by, by policy. So if we uh, focus just on, on, on Europe and de de defining how, how we are going to do that. Um, uh, well, other markets are not, are not waiting. Huh? In in Europe, uh, if we look into steel, we have only the Scandinavian countries that have uh, significant iron ore reserves. Uh, so other um, big players are in Australia, Chile, uh, Canada, Bra Brazil. And these countries have also excellent uh, boundary conditions on, on renewable renewable energy and uh, and green uh, green hydrogen. So what we I think the, the pace is important to 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 avoid to to kill jobs in in, in, in the industry, because it might happen that the uh, added uh, value chain in, in dimension the regions um, um, expand um, to to provide green green metallics uh, and then even carbon ore adjustment uh, would, would, uh, would not help. This is green, green metallics at the end. So we would lose a certain part of the upstream um, steel making uh, value, value chain in, in, in Europe, and that would be tremendous. Okay, thank you. I saw that Serpa uh, Pitikainen, you wanted uh, to react about the discussion around CCS and hydrogen and the relative role that they can play for decarbonization, Sirpa. Yes, indeed. And Eric actually said it already that uh, I do see that uh, the CCU nor CCS can be the major solution, but for the traces that are going to be left anyway, that is something that uh, probably would would be needed to uh, to be added. And then actually, Max underlined the another point about should we prefer. Uh, put the preference on steel industry, for example. To me, it's not a regulation. It is exactly this question. Do you gear the investment supports uh, towards, uh, uh, towards steel industry and uh, related hydrogen uh, production there? Or do you gear it in uh, uh, constructions and buildings where you could do an enormous set with energy efficiency alone or then the transportation and there comes my sort of a priority and it's much more of where you uh, where you direct your funds not the sort of a regulatory framework thank you okay thanks um i think we're reaching uh, the end of this virtual event but before we close um, i will ask each one of you to summarize in just a few very concise and short points what you would like uh, our viewers to take away uh, with them from this event 
Um, and so let me start um, from the side of industry uh, with you, Alexander Fleischhandel. Thanks, uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, I think the main uh, main takeaway is uh, uh, what uh, what we could see what happened over the past twelve months uh, in, in in Europe for for the hard to abate industry is significant um, on both ends, um, uh, politics as well on uh, and and uh, uh, regulation side, as well as on the industry side, uh, technology development. So, at the end. Um, I don't see a roadblock that we we cannot make it. So as we've seen in in this discussion today, there it it requires a continuation of this discussion to to close some financing gaps on the capex and on uh, on the operational side. But I'm quite optimistic with uh, the um, set of targets that uh, finally uh, Europe will will uh, and European industry will 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 achieve their their targets. Okay, uh, Erika Mink, uh, main takeaways from your side. Yeah, no, um, you know, I was again encouraged to see there is really a willingness by all, on all sides to really find solutions and also for the sticky points. And I think one sticky point remains, you know, it's a free allocation and see them, how do we get these two worlds together? And my reflection is, you know, um, Maybe then, if you know, if this can't be solved before June, um, before the Commission comes forward with the legislative proposals, we may want to think: Can we, you know, could we agree then to have the steel industry not necessarily in the first pilot round, but uh, at a later point? I think it's really critical that we that we get this uh, that that we find a mechanism whereby we will not have. Uh, a significant cost increase for the uh, on the business so that it absorbs and takes resources which we uh, urgently need uh, for for the transformation and i also would suggest uh, that at at some point you know we need to see i mean the, the whole concept of of just transition we should uh, we should strengthen a bit uh, a bit more and and also see you know uh, to to, to, to be sure that whatever we do, you know, it is also acceptable in terms of uh, jobs, development of jobs uh, uh, and employment for the future. I think that aspect we need to bring um, much, uh, much stronger to the debate as well. But I'm, I'm really encouraged because I believe everybody wants to find workable solutions and, uh, and that's, that's excellent. Thank you. All right. Thanks, uh, Max Orman. Uh very quick concluding thoughts from your side. Well, on the very positive side, enormously has happened with the steel industry and its position in long-term climate policy the last five years. Uh, so I would really like to applaud the steel industry. And I hope soon that the petrochemical industry will also make the same transition and really plan their things. <clears throat> so I think that's very good. Uh, what we've been talked about that is a lot about creating the right long-term conditions for actually being able to make the huge investments that are risky and where policy is a major risk factor to make them feasible under a normal business condition and i think uh, there is a way for this uh, i think one of the main things that is still lacking in a european policy mix is to create a clear market signal that green steel will be for sought for after uh, 2030 that that is the way to go uh, a market um, that we are willing to pay a bit more for green steel because we find it worth it thank you okay sir uh, your concluding thoughts well first let us all remember that we are in a climate biodiversity and all in all in sustainability crisis that is exponential and it is speeding up fast so this is a real extinct, uh, existential question to humanity. And the question is, why didn't we have these discussions 10 years ago or even 20 years ago? And now we are late already. So we need to act fast. We need to accelerate our actions. We need to increase our ambition level. And we need to uh, increase agility also in politics to find these uh, new sets, what we've discussed today. 
how to, to bridge the transition challenges in our industries. So there's an ambition uh, level uh, uh, upgrade need both in industry and uh, in politics. Thank you. And Mete Kafut Queen, you have the privilege of, of closing this event. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I can support a lot of what was said here in the closing remarks. And uh, indeed, what I would like to mention or repeat is that we also see there's a huge uh, change. A lot has happened in, in the steel industry and in other energy intensive industries in the past five years. That is a very positive uh, change towards the climate neutrality uh, um, ambition. Um, we need to put policies in place, long term policies. We see carbon pricing as a very key uh, tool, um, but it's not enough for full decarbonization by 2050. So I would say additional policies to support this uh, are very needed. Uh, innovation support, support to electrification, rollout of renewable energy um, and uh, support to hydrogen uh, production. Um, and then also, as Erika was mentioning, we need to look at the same time as a, at the just transition. And I think we try to look at all these at the same time. Uh, we need to continue to address the risk of carbon leakage, uh, either with free allocation or with CBAM. And we need to see the broader context uh, for all of this. And finally, uh, I would like to say what we need to continue to work uh, closely together uh, industry, authorities, and all the concerned parties. Uh, this is the only way we can truly transform our uh, economies uh, and increase the, the resilience uh, of the energy intensive industries also. Right. Uh, thank you. I think this wraps up uh, today's event. Um, a big thanks to Mitsubishi Heavy Industries for supporting it. Uh, thank you as well, of course, to our panelists for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, in case you liked uh, this uh, virtual event, well, we have a lot more coming up on Your Active. Just check our website, events.youractive.com, for more detail. And if you've missed the beginning of this event, well, you will be soon uh, able to watch it in full on YouTube. So we hope to see you again soon. Until then... Have a good day, stay safe, and bye for now.